But my mood has recovered since the Detroit Lions lost in the NFC Championship game. I'm almost over it. All right. Bujou, Mino Gizhe. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, miigwech, thank you to Chairman Macaro and the NCAI uh, for having me back again. Uh, I also want to, uh, before I get too far down the road, uh, you know, you guys see me here a lot. Uh, we talk to each other a lot. Um, but uh, a lot of the heavy burdens in our team are really carried uh, by the brilliant people uh, who serve uh, out of the spotlight. And so, uh, and literally in the shadows over here is one of our senior policy counselors, Sam Kung, uh, from the Crow Tribe. Sam does amazing work for us. Sam, wave your, poke your head into the light. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Megan Bishop, our brand new uh, policy counselor in our office, uh, she, she does just such amazing work for us, and I, I want to make sure I acknowledge them. Uh, next week is my third year anniversary on the job here. And I don't know how many of you remember the, the before times when we were uh, doing a lot of work at, at home. But three years ago, the, uh, next week, I joined uh, this session of NCAI in my first week on the job from my workspace at my house at, at Bay Mills Indian Community. Um, and uh, the week before I had actually been serving as, as tribal chairman, uh, and it was really just a whipsaw transition to be speaking to NCAI uh, from Bay Mills, um, setting out on this journey with President Biden and Secretary Holland. And in that conversation, uh, we talked about the need for investments in India country and President Biden's plans to make those investments. We also talked about improving the land and the trust process and elevating the department's work to address the MMIW crisis across Indian country. And I remember at that time, as I was saying those words and, and talking with some of you after that, there was a, a mix of skepticism uh, along with hope in response to that conversation. Because over the years, decades and centuries, we've had a lot of different policies come out of the federal government relating to Indian country. Most of them were bad, uh, but some of them were good. And when we look across those policy areas, we can see that leadership really matters. When people make decisions for Indian people, without any idea of how their work impacts the daily lives of people in tribal communities, without any collaboration or consultation, we know that the results are consistently bad for Indian people. And President Biden understands that, and Secretary Holland understands that, and that's why he asked Secretary Holland to lead the department in these times. And we've built a team at the department who understand the connection between our work, what we do here in Washington, D.C., and the lives of people in tribal communities. In fact, many of us still live in our tribal communities. We understand the importance of partnering with people in tribal government to make life better for people in your communities. For many of us, we've been on the receiving end of the federal government's Indian policies. For many of us, we've had to make federal funds and programs work for tribal governments and community organizations. And the President and Secretary Holland understand that it's not just enough to promise to make those investments, that we have to follow through. And they also know that funding those promises isn't enough either. We have to make sure that that money, those investments, can actually be put to use in tribal communities, and they have to make life better for the people we serve. So in the past three years, since we first met one another in, the, in this relationship, we've worked to do just that through the President's Investing in America agenda. This included $32 billion in investments in, the, in India country through the American Rescue Plan, and those funds went to tribal governments and tribal members to catch up on long overdue investments. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, 
which our department continues to implement, invested another $13 billion in Indian country. And that's just not numbers. Those investments are making a difference in people's lives all across the country. They're helping tribes adapt to a changing climate, like at the Havasupai tribe, which I recently visited. They're bolstering tribal water and power infrastructure, like at Hopi. They've helped to repair and improve fish hatcheries that are vital to the restoration of salmon, which we've seen all over the Pacific Northwest. And they're bringing electricity to people's homes that have never had it before, and so much more. These are investments that are actually making life better for Indian people. And I see it when I go home to my own tribal community time after time. These are historic investments, and they're unprecedented. But we also know that we haven't solved every problem and every challenge facing Indian country. And this is, again, another place where leadership matters. President Biden, Secretary Holland, and others in the administration have been working to tra change and transform how federal funds are used so they can be maximized in our communities. We've got now a half century of experience that shows, that proves, self-determination works. When tribes have funds and decision-making authority on how to spend them and don't have to worry about bureaucratic procedures in the federal government, we know that good things happen for Indian people. So let's take the Tuwahe program, for example. This started as a pilot program for four tribes to allow them to customize federal funding to deliver social services in their communities. In the past year, we've been able to expand this program to support 65 tribes. We've gone from four tribes to 65 tribes. Yes. We've also started the Tiwahe Incubator to aid tribes in developing their own Tiwahe plans so when BIA receives additional appropriations that they're ready to join this program. In the last fiscal year, President Biden's administration requested an additional $33.5 million in funding to continue to expand this program. We've also worked to make it easier for tribes to bundle programs together to support workforce development under Public Law 477. My wife writes grants for a living. She's often up late at night at home, cursing the federal government on her computer, trying to meet a deadline. Uh, I've had the uh, pleasure of overseeing the federal grant process when I served at my own tribe. And we all, everybody here in this room knows that those deadlines and reporting requirements and compliance can be just an enormous pain. And we know that when our team members at the tribal, at the tribal headquarters, when they're spending their time on grant compliance, you know what they're not doing? They're not spending time serving our people. That's right, thank you. So Vice President Harris and Secretary Holland led the development of a new workforce development process that ensures that tribes can support tribal members trying to get and keep jobs so they can support their families. And most importantly, the Vice President and the Secretary made sure that tribes were in the room and at the table when we designed this process. And so as a mark of how successful and how popular this workforce development program has been across Indian country, we now have more than half of all federally recognized tribes participating in the 477 program. And in the past year, we've seen phenomenal growth and interest in this program and are seeing a lot of innovative proposals from tribes to include new types of grants in their workforce development plans. I mentioned earlier self-determination, and we're all familiar with that process. Over the last 50 years, the Self-Determination Act has been an unqualified success. It's helped tribes build governing capacity, it's created jobs, and it's strengthened tribal sovereignty. But as tribes have improved their ability to deliver government services to their people through self-determination, we, in the federal government, have not kept up in supporting the physical infrastructure needed to deliver those services. Tribes have had to carry that burden almost exclusively on your own. 
Under Public Law 638, the BIA and the Indian Health Service can provide funding for this infrastructure under a self-determination lease. In, in our offices at the department, we call these 105L leases because there is actually a federal rule that says when you do something exciting, you have to give it the most boring title possible. So we call them 105L leases. But these uh, self-determination leases help tribes pay for buildings and physical spaces where they deliver government services under 638 contracts and compacts. In the past four years, the BIA has worked with tribes to expand this funding. So four years ago, you know, this, this authority for these leases has ex existed for 50 years. Four years ago, across the whole country, we had fewer than five of these leases. Now, we've got more than 400. Thank you. And we've got requests for hundreds more self-determination leases. So in the, in the real world, out where we live, in our communities, this means hundreds of millions of dollars for things like health centers, schools, wellness courts, and office space, and much more. And tribes control this funding and design these spaces to implement these programs. This is hundreds of millions of dollars on top of annual appropriations on top of the American Rescue Plan, on top of the bipartisan infrastructure law, on top of the Inflation Reduction Act. So you hear us talk about $45 billion a lot, plus our appropriations. These 105L leases are money on top of that. And it puts tribes in the driver's seat on how they're spent. Secretary Holland has also worked to transform the land into trust process and the department's procurement process. And for the first time in the history of the Department of the Interior, we now have regulations that say it is our policy to ensure that every single tribe that wants a protected homeland in trust should have a protected homeland in trust. And as you heard us announce at the Tribal Nations Summit in December, we have completed those regulations to actually make it easier and faster to put land into trust, fulfilling President Biden's commitment to Indian country. We've also changed our regulations to make sure that we are uh, purchasing goods and services at the department from Indian-owned businesses. Again, this isn't just a policy on a piece of paper. It's action that affects people on the ground. So in 2020, under the Buy Indian Act, the Department of the Interior purchased $516 million in goods and services from Indian-owned businesses. Last year, we purchased more than $1.4 billion in goods and services from Indian-owned businesses across Indian country. This is money that supports tribal businesses and individual businesses in your communities. Yes, that's a lot of money. And you've heard us talk about the historic levels of investment the president's made in Indian country, and we've done our best to put our money where our mouth is. But these actions I just described also show that we've worked to transform how the money flows from the federal government to you, so that tribes and Indian people have more control over how it's used. And in December, President Biden made this principle the official policy of the executive branch when he signed a new executive order to reform how agencies develop budgets and spend their funds for Indian country. This executive order directs federal agencies to reduce administrative burdens and by administering funding in a manner that provides tribes with the greatest possible autonomy to address the specific needs of their people. The president has directed all federal agencies to work with tribes to remove barriers to federal funding like uh, grant matching requirements, reporting burdens, and developing tribal set-asides. And the President's executive order also directs agencies to identify policies and regulations that need to be changed to carry this out. And it directs all federal agencies to assess chronic shortfalls in funding to tribes and identify the funding 
the United States needs to live up to our trust obligations. Not just the BIA, not just IHS, all federal agencies. This executive order builds on what we've proven over the last half century, that when we invest in our obligations to Indian people, and when we make it easier for Indian people to access those funds, good things happen. So you can see that we've been working hard alongside all of you to make long overdue investments in Indian country and to respond to the challenges faced by this generation and coming generations. I've worked so hard, I've got a lot more gray hair than the first time we sat down together three years ago. But we're also working to make sure that Indian people are driving how these investments reach people. We know we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but these changes will ensure that this progress is sustainable, that it outlives our tenures in these jobs. And years from now, I think, as an Indian law and policy nerd, uh, we're gonna look back at these last few years and really see it as a turning point in how we took self-determination and this principle uh, within the federal government to the next level to meet our trust obligation to Indian people. And these changes don't happen unless you have leaders who understand. They don't happen without all of you leading us to where we have to go. When we came into these jobs three years ago, we said that we were gonna do our best to make a difference in the lives of Indian people, and I believe that we're doing it. And most importantly, we're doing it the right way in partnership with all of you. Your leadership matters. I want to say miigwech, thank you again to all of you who serve, who answer the call to serve your tribal communities and for sharing your leadership, your wisdom, and your work with us for your support. And I look forward to continuing to work together. Miigwech, thank you so much.